From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio WYBC and 1490 AM WGCH Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. The man who led the U.S. Special Operations Forces that got Osama bin Laden and the man who says if you want to change the world, make your bed. An American hero today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell, Admiral William H. McRaven, U.S. Navy retired, served 37 years as a Navy SEAL, and as a four-star admiral, his final assignment was as commander of all the U.S. Special Operations Forces. He's now Chancellor of the University of Texas System. And in 2014, he gave a commencement address at the University of Texas on the theme, If You Want to Change the World, Make Your Bed. That's gone viral, now been viewed almost 25 million times. That's like make a speech and change the world. And now he's written a book, Change the World, Make Your Bed, Little Things That Can Change Your Life and Maybe the World. Welcome, Admiral. How are you? Yeah, it's good to be here. Great. It's great to have you. And I told my brother earlier this week in Chicago, I was having you on, he said to tell you he does make his bed now. (laughs) So you continue... Uh you continue to have in, impact. I do, but I'm embarrassed because I don't. I know I would not ma- uh, pass your inspection standards. Well, I'm flattered. flattered. <laughs> What's your feeling now that that the impact that this speech had? Um, were you stunned? Were you surprised? Were you amazed how uh, how the military um, applicability just switched over to civilian so easy? Yeah, I was uh, quite a bit surprised uh, after I gave the speech. I remember my daughter calling me up and saying, uh, hey, the speech is on YouTube and it's going viral. And to kind of show you what an old man I am, I I didn't know what going viral meant. Um, But it didn't take me long to figure out that it was getting a lot of traction. And and frankly, I think the reason the speech, not just the point about making your bed, Mm -hmm. but the other life lessons really apply whether you're in the military. You know, it doesn't make any difference what your race or your gender is or your orientation and this was the point I brought out in the speech. Is these, are, these are life lessons, and I think that's why they have uh, really resonated so well with the public. The, uh, the whole SEALs and the BUDS training and everything and the, the survival rate of guys that get through that program um, seems so low and, and so differentiated. Uh, it, it just strikes me as really fascinating that um, you, you can bring it right into everybody. Well, again, it is a little bit of, as I used to say, life jammed into about six months. So basic SEAL training is six months long. But in the course of that six months, again, much like life, uh, you know, you're, you're going to fail. Uh, you're going to have those dark moments. Uh, you're going to learn lessons about life, like making your bed. So, you know, when you take a look at what we as young uh, SEAL aspirants learn going through training, it really did set you up for the rest of your career or, frankly, the rest of life. Did you feel, does everybody go in there feeling, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get through this? No, I think just the opposite. I think everybody goes into it, I hope everybody goes into it, thinking they're going to make it. I think then all of a sudden they're confronted with the reality of, well, you know, maybe I didn't quite have the, the toughness, the mental toughness I thought I had to make it through. Uh, I certainly know I went into it assuming I was going to make it through. And, uh, and I don't think at any point in time in SEAL training that I really doubt that I would make it through because I just was prepared to, you know, not quit. People often ask me, what's the, you know, what is the secret of SEAL training? You know, how fast do you have to be? How strong do you have to be? I said, look, it's none of those things. The secret of SEAL training is just don't quit. Yeah. If you don't quit, then you'll make it through. It's like Woody, uh, Woody Allen, 90% of life is showing up. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay, let, let's just start with that, uh, uh, the, the make your bed um, uh, example. T- tell us exactly what you mean. And, and uh, I was reminded, Bill Parcells, you know, the famous Giants coach, sure, he course. used to say, um, no medals for trying. And this is kind of like do your job, <laughs> right? Well, it was a little bit more than that. So every morning uh, in SEAL training, uh, we would have to go in, we'd have a uniform inspection, and they would inspect our room, which, of course, included our bed. And we had a very simple Navy rack, you know, and uh, it was a, you know, just a single bed. Uh, it, it had just a single mattress on it on a steel uh, frame. But you had to make the bed to exacting standards. So you had to have the 45-degree hospital corners. You had to have the second wool blanket uh, exactly aligned with the bed post at the end. The pillow had to be centered right at the top. And then, of course, the bed had to be very, very taut. 
And, and, you know, I didn't quite understand when we got there. We all wanted to be, you know, hardened SEAL warriors. And the first thing they're trying to teach you is to make your bed. And, and, and of course, it took me a while to understand the value of that. But the point they were making, I think there were two points they were making. One, this really was our first task of the day. And so you got up every morning and you had to make your bed. And, and when you made your bed and when it was the first task of the day, it really gave you some, some impetus to go on and do the next task and the next task and the next task. But the other piece of this was, hey, this is, it's a little chore. It, it's not hard. Make your bed. And if you, if you can't do the little things right, how are you ever going to do the big things right? How are you ever going to lead a SEAL mission if you can't even make your bed correctly? So there were a, a number of points that I think the SEAL instructors were trying to make as they, quote, unquote, encouraged you to make your bed. And, of course, if you fail to make your bed right, then you, you paid the price by having to run out into the surf zone, get wet and roll around in the sand and uh, become a sugar cookie. Yeah, I always say that the other good thing about this is you can have a really bad day where everything goes wrong, but this is one built-in success every day. Right. If you do, if you do it, you know, a good, if you make the bed the way it should yeah. be. Uh, I, I want to talk about standing up to bullies now because it segues in, into some other stuff. Tell us about that one. In this case, uh, it was a bit of an analogy, but a true analogy. So when we get out to San Clemente Island, so when I went through SEAL training, San Clemente Island was the third phase of training. And very early on in our time out of San Clemente Island, we had to do the night swim, and it was considered the swim with the sharks. And so prior to the swim, the instructors would call all of the trainees into the classroom, and they'd say, okay, you know, we're going to start at this point, and you're going to be swimming, uh, and I think it was a three-mile swim. And they would always tell you, but look, there are a lot of sharks out there. And part of this was kind of a scare tactic on the, on the part of the instructors. But then they said, look, if, if you see a shark beginning to circle you, don't try to outrun the shark. You're not going to swim faster than the shark. So stand your ground, get back to back with your swim buddy. And then as he circles, the circle will get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the shark will come at you. And then you have to punch him in the nose, punch him in the snout, and they'll go away. And, uh, and, of course, we believe that uh, because the instructors told us to believe that. And there is actually some truth if you look at uh, how to deal with sharks in the open water. But the point of that really was the analogy of bullies. Um, you know, you, you, everybody's got bullies in their life. You know, you're going to have schoolyard bullies. You're going to have bullies in the workspace. Uh, and I can tell you, having traveled all around the world, there are tyrants and dictators that are bullies. And if, if you want to set things right, you have to stand up to the bullies. Uh, you can't back down from them. You can't outswim them in many cases. You can't run away from them. Sometimes you just have to stand your ground and punch them in the nose. In fact, uh, I was going to segue right to there. You dealt with some bullies, particularly in your, in your last job, and you did write in the book, Without Courage, Men Will Be Ruled by Tyrants. Um, you got Saddam, and uh, I thought it was interesting that you felt one of the uh, strategies to break the bullying down was to make him feel like he wasn't important anymore. What did you do exactly? Well, he had been, of course, the uh, president of Iraq, the ruler of this country. He'd had, uh, he lived in a giant palace. He had generals and uh, handmaidens and, and everything going for him. And after he was captured by U.S. troops, uh, we held him for about a month in a, in a very small room. Uh, he had a cot. Uh, I kept, uh, you know, a guard in there, but I didn't let anybody see him because I think uh, he felt that, well, you know, people will come to visit me. Uh, the new leadership of Iraq will come to visit me. Important generals will come to visit me. Uh, reporters will come to visit me. And of course I ensured that no one came to visit him. Hmm. Uh, I would come in every day just to check on him to make sure that he was healthy and, and well. Uh, but I wouldn't even speak to him. And, and after a while, uh, he realized that he was no longer important. And this was a little bit, uh, I think, about how you have to deal with bullies, is uh, if they think the actions they're, they're going to take are going to you know, make them more important, then they tend to want to do those things. And sometimes you just have to make sure that bullies recognize that you're no longer important. And in the case of Saddam, uh, because we had nobody come talk to him, because he was essentially alone and isolated, uh, after a while, you saw that that cock sureness, uh, that cockiness, uh, really uh, go away pretty quickly. We got about a minute to go in this segment. What about Assad, who uses chemical weapons on his folks, and it's a, it's essentially war crimes? Um, do, do, does a tyrant like that have to be taken out, or it's just something we have to wait until it happens? 
Well, again, you know, th- this is one that uh, the Syrian people are, I think, trying to do the right thing. When you when you see the civil war that is occurring and the, the attempt by the moderate Syrians to overthrow Assad, I mean, Assad has to go. Uh, there is no question about it. We're not going to be able to get there without the Russians' help because the Russians are trying to protect the Assad regime. Uh, but frankly, I don't think the, the Russians care any more about Assad than we do. What they care about is that strip of land from Aleppo down to uh, down to Damascus. They care about a warm water port. Um, but but sooner or later, uh, the Syrian people, we in the U.S., the international community, you have to stand up to Assad, and and we've got to force him out or. Syria will be in this kind of constant state of civil war for a long time. This is the Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Biz Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. Go to biztalkradio.com, find the station closest to you, or listen over the Internet, access our podcast. We'll get next to more little things to change the world. And we're back with the former and first leader of the U.S. Special Ops, Admiral McRaven. Am I right? You were the first uh, to have all the combined uh, forces special ops? Well, not exactly. So I ran the, all of U.S. special operations, but Admiral Eric Olson uh, was the SEAL in the job before me. So no, I was the oh, okay. first Admiral Eric Olson was. Okay. Uh, while we were on the uh, on the Putin issue or the Russian issue, I mean, this is a guy that also uh, bullies people in this country by killing them. He's meddled in the UK, uh, Ukraine and C- Crimea. He's undermining our strategy in Syria and his own economy's in trouble. Um, and do- he has not called out Syria for using the gas and may have been complicit. Wh- wh- what do you do about a- a- that kind of a bully? Well, um, uh, I will have to uh, you know, applaud uh, President Trump uh, at this point in time, mm-hmm. because I do think that the actions that he took in Syria were the correct ones. Uh, again, this gets back to you cannot allow a bully, and frankly, I've called Putin a bully for several years now. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you can't allow a bully to march into Crimea. You can't allow a bully to, to prop up a, a government like Assad. You can't allow a bully to do the sorts of things that the Russian government kind of is doing around the world. So at some point in time, you really do have to stand up to him. And and I thought the strike in Syria was uh, was appropriate. It was proportional. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in the case of Putin, you just can't do something like that once. You're going to have to keep the pressure on. You're going to have to show that, that we have the strength necessary to stand up to that bully. So, so if I extrapolate, you, you, do we try to undermine him, the, his economy, et cetera, and, and to the point where he's maybe out of power? Or where are you going with that? Well, it, it's pretty complex. And again, I, this isn't about the Russian people. Uh, this oh, no. Is yeah. About, yeah, this is about the, the Russian leader. So I, I do think there needs to be a, an international commitment uh, to put Putin in his place uh, in terms of you know, not being allowed to kind of push the Europeans around and to push uh, you know, uh, others around. So you're just going to have to be strong. And, and I'm hoping that uh, Secretary Tillerson, as he goes, at least uh, I know when he went to Russia uh, last week, I mean, his ability to engage, to say, look, we're, we're, we expect certain behavior out of the Russians. We're happy to work with you uh, where it is appropriate to do so. But you have to understand there is, uh, there is acceptable international behavior, and, and you're not uh, behaving appropriately. So some of this is going to have to be diplomatic. Some of this is going to have to be uh, with the use of, uh, again, strikes into Syria, where we need to make a point uh, about his actions in Syria. But uh, but we have to stand up to Putin where where and when he crosses these uh, these lines of uh, international norms. Um, now I don't want you to beat up on President Obama here now, but I want to ask the the statement of a red line and then not really following through seems to be a really uh, bad thing in the Middle East, particularly where all the dictators and tyrants uh, respect strength. Do you think that was a mistake to issue a statement like that and then end up not following through? Well, let me say first and foremost, I would never beat up on President Obama because I have a great deal of respect for him. Right. Uh, You know, I spent several years uh, working for President Obama, and I can tell you what the American people never had a chance to see was all of the the authorized uh, strikes that we did uh, you know, around the world uh, at the president's uh, with the president's approval. And, and these were important to to keep America safe. Uh, obviously, any time you make a statement, and whether it's President Obama or President Trump or President Bush, mm-hmm. when you make when you make a statement to the international community, it's important that you you know you adhere to that. Um, 
So, you know, it, it's hard for me to say whether or not, uh, you know, backing off from the red line you know, had a second and third order effect. I can just tell you in general that any time the head of, of a state uh, makes a declaratory statement, it's important to follow through with it. Uh, one more bully, uh, because the intel community seems to feel this may be the biggest worry because he's not a rational guy, and that, of course, is the guy in North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Um, is that a guy we're going to eventually we are going to have to stand up uh, and maybe utilize take out his new capacity or or what 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 about a guy like that? Well, uh, you know, unlike Putin, who I believe to be a rational actor, yeah. so, you know, you can deal with rational actors. I do not believe KJU Kim Jong Un is a ra- is a rational actor, uh, and nothing in Bill McRaven's opinion, nothing that we do or the Chinese do are going to stop uh, Kim Jong Un from trying to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, so, you know, again, having been out of the military for a while, but knowing what they are thinking through, they are looking at all options uh, militarily, diplomatically. Um, but Kim Jong Un is going to do everything he can to get a nuclear weapon, not only a nuclear weapon, but a a small enough nuclear weapon that he can put it on a on a ballistic missile. Uh, so. We absolutely have to do something, and I think all options should be on the table. Are, are we absolutely certain that he's crazy? Well, I, I don't know if, if you can if you can say he's clinically crazy, but certainly the actions that he has taken over the years, he is starving his people. Uh, you know, he, he murders people that disagree with him. Yeah. So I, I would say uh, crazy uh, fits, uh, you know, fits his personality, even though I'm not a clinical psychologist. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about team now, one of your important principles. And you say you can't go it alone, find someone to help you paddle. Talk about that. And, and your parachute story was, uh, to me, pretty uh, pretty amazing. And your career ended up being, you know, preserved, even though you were almost literally ripped apart. Well, when I was, uh, I, I was what was called the Commodore. So I was in charge of all the SEALs on the West Coast and went out for a free fall parachute jump. And this was in, uh, in 2001. Uh, summer of 2001. It was a, a beautiful, you know, California day. Uh, unfortunately, the jump didn't turn out so well. Uh, I had a jumper that slid underneath me uh, right before uh, we were we were going to hit pull altitude. He pulled, and of course, in relative speed, you know, he was coming up while I was going down. As I veered off, uh, I pulled. I was tumbling. Parachute got wrapped around my legs, uh, uh, both legs, and eventually. And I guess fortunately or unfortunately, it opened. But in the course of opening, it kind of cracked me in two like a nutcracker. Um, and uh, so it, it separated my pelvis by about uh, four or five inches. Uh, kind of pulled all the muscles out of my uh, my stomach. Uh, screwed up my back pretty bad. But the point of the story uh, was that uh, you know at that point in time, I thought I was pretty invincible. I'd been in the SEAL teams for a long time. I had survived a lot of uh, near-death uh, incidents, uh, near-death events, and, and always thought I could. But this day, I didn't. And uh, so as I'm, I'm lying in the hospital bed, and the doctors uh, kind of give me the old, well, you're banged up pretty bad, and uh, I don't know how, how much of a career you're going to have left as a Navy SEAL. You know, people came to help me through that tough time. I talk about the fact that my wife, uh, you know, when, when they wheeled me back to my, uh, to my house, I was in a, in a hospital bed in my house, and my wife, uh, would give me the shots every day. Uh, she would uh, you know, uh, take out my bedpan and do all the sort of nursing duties that were required. But my friends came by. I talk about the fact that my friend uh, and my boss, Admiral Eric Olson, uh, somehow managed to avoid uh, what was required by the Navy was to do a medical examination. And I told Admiral Olson, I-, I will be at my change of command out of a wheelchair. And he said, if you can be at your change of command out of a wheelchair, uh, then I'll talk to the chief of naval operations and we will try to uh, avoid having to do a medical evaluation because had they done a medical evaluation, uh, I probably would not have gone on to be a flag officer. So the point is everybody had to come together. Uh, I needed all those people to help me paddle at that point in time. And, and, uh, and the lesson there is you just can't get through life by yourself. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care if you're a medal of honor recipient, Navy seal, you cannot get through life uh, by yourself. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell from our flagship stations, WGCH Greenwich and WYBC Yale Radio. We'll learn that failure can be good. Next.
We're back with Admiral Phil McRaven. He's got a book out, Make Your Bed, Little Things That Can Change Your Life and Maybe the World. And uh, one of the things that SEALs training does, and you said this right up front, is uh, put you through a lot of instances where you fail and you got to keep coming back. Uh, tell us how fail, uh, failure makes uh, you stronger and you uh, say, don't be afraid of the circus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in SEAL training, uh, we used to have a thing called the circus. And, uh, and if you failed during the day, so if you failed to meet the times on your runs, if you failed to meet the times on your swims, if the instructors didn't like the way you were doing push-ups, they would put you on the circus list. And then at the end of every standard training day, you'd have about another hour and a half or two hours of additional physical training. And, and the hard part about the circus was by the time you got through with that, you were exhausted. And, and you had to get up early the next day, and it, it became this kind of you know, cycle uh, of death, if you will, in terms of uh, you, were, you were tired. Then the next day you were tired, which meant that you weren't going to make the times on the runs or the swims. So now you're back at the circus again, and then you got tired again for the next day. And so uh, this, this spiral of failure uh, caused a lot of guys to drop out. But what you learned is if you could survive those days – uh, you would eventually make it to a weekend, and, and you could kind of recoup and regenerate. But the point was, sometimes those failures actually made you stronger because you did two additional hours of physical training every day. So you got stronger doing your push-ups. You got stronger doing your pull-ups. You got stronger doing your flutter kicks. And eventually you broke out of the kind of the cycle of failure and found that, hey, that failure had, in fact, made you physically stronger in training. And, of course, life is like that as well. You know, we're all going to fail at certain points in times, and, and you need to learn from your failures. You need to learn from your mistakes. And, uh, and generally, you know, once you learn from them, it will make you better, and hopefully you'll make less mistakes next time. But, but we're all prone to failure. You know, we, we will all fail at some point in time, uh, and a lot of times those failures, if taken correctly, will make you stronger. I thought it was a great story that you and I guess your buddy who were swimming were finishing last, and by the time you'd gone through the uh, circus, you were actually finished first which is uh, uh, quite an increase. Let me uh, One more thing on failure. You, you were relieved of your uh, SEAL squadron leadership at one point, I guess trying to push through too much change uh, at once. Uh, what was that like? Well, of course, it, it's never good to get fired. <laughs> it's particularly not good to get fired in the Navy. <laughs> um, but I, I was relieved of my, of my uh, position. It wasn't a command position, although I was in charge. You know, there's a distinction in the Navy between actually being in command and being in charge. But I was in charge of a very important uh, SEAL squadron. Um, and, and again, I failed. And the commanding officer uh, basically relieved me of that position, uh, fired me. And, uh, and that was a very difficult thing to deal with because in a small community like ours, I went on to another command. And uh, to the commanding officer's credit, uh, he did not give me any bad paper, so to speak. So my fitness report... While it wasn't great, it, was, it didn't kill me, if you will, as an officer. Um, so I went on to another command, but everybody at that command knew that I had failed. And so for years, you have to live with this, you know, people kind of whispering when they meet you, oh, yeah, McRaven, I, you know, isn't he the guy that got dropped from the last SEAL team? And, and so, you know, you spend your time realizing that, hey, you, you have one or two choices. You can just get out of the Navy. You can quit. Get away from all this. Or you can prove to people that, no, you're better than this. And, uh, and again, I was fortunate. We talk about having people to help you paddle. My wife, once again, said, look, you know, you, you love doing this too much. You're better than this. Uh, I had friends that came to me that said, look, you know, you're a great officer. Don't let this get you down. And, uh, and they kind of helped me through that very rough uh, time in my life. And, uh, and fortunately, things worked out. Um, life's often not, not fair. Tell us, what is a sugar cookie? <laughs> well, a sugar cookie is uh, when, when, in, when an instructor decides that for whatever reason, and that is the point of it, for whatever reason, uh, he thinks you're not doing well, uh, he could make you a sugar cookie. So you would run, you, you know, our training was right along the beach in Coronado, California. So you'd run, jump into the ocean, so you get soaking wet, then you come back and you roll around in the sand and then you throw sand all over you so you were covered kind of head to toe in sand. And you spend, you know, the rest of the day or most of the day kind of covered with sand in between your armpits and between your legs. But it was the indiscriminate nature of the sugar cookie that bothered a lot of people. You know, the circus was one where 
if you failed an event, then you knew you were going to be in the circus. But a sugar cookie, uh, an instructor just could very indiscriminately say, I don't like your face. I don't like what you're doing. Uh, go hit the surf and, and you know, become a sugar cookie. And some guys had trouble dealing with that. We, I had one officer in particular uh, who did not make it through training, and he would come in every day, and his uniform was perfect. He, everything about him was perfect, and, the, and he still became a sugar cookie. And I remember talking to him afterwards, and he said, I just don't get it. I mean, my uniform was perfect. Why, am I, why did I have to hit the surf? And, of course, it was, it was easy because the instructors were trying to tell you that life isn't fair. Sometimes, you know, your uniform can look perfect. Sometimes you can do the best job possible, and you still become a sugar cookie. And you needed to learn that in SEAL training because, again, you're going to deal with it in life. Sometimes you can be the, the best SEAL officer, the best SEAL enlisted man, uh, and things aren't going to turn out well. Sometimes you can be the best student, the best businessman, and things aren't going to turn out well. So uh, you just have to realize life isn't fair, and the sugar cookie helped reinforce that. I think I'd rather eat them than uh, be one, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh, only the size of your heart matters. We're talking character there. One thing I'd, I'd, I'd heard about the SEALs in the past is that sometimes you'll get an ex-pro athlete or an ex-Olympic athlete, and they're often not the guys that do the best. No, exactly right. In fact, we had some remarkable athletes uh, in my training class, uh, several of, of whom didn't make it through. So in the... In the speech, I talked about the Munchkin crew, and these were the little guys. <laughs> and and most of them weren't over about five foot five. You know, a lot of people when you think of Navy SEALs, you think of these these big, uh, you know, six foot two, six foot three guys with bulging muscles. The reality of the matter is, most of the SEALs are probably between about you know five eight and five ten. They're wiry guys because it's it's easier to make it through training when you're you know kind of medium build and wiry. But the small guys uh, that were, again, under about five foot five, they all had a certain boat crew. But I got to tell you, uh, these guys were some of the toughest guys we had in training. Uh, we, had, we had one young fellow that was always the first in the obstacle course, even though the obstacle course was seemingly built for a big man. Uh, they were some of the better runners and the better swimmers. Um, and, and, again, the lesson learned there was yeah, it really didn't make any difference what your size was, what your color was, because in this Munchkin boat crew, we had an, uh, an African-American, an American Indian. We had a French-American. We had a Polish-American. It was a very uh, diverse boat crew uh, that, that made up the Munchkin crew, and yet they were incredibly tough, incredibly resilient. And then you saw some of the big, tough guys that uh, were great football players or baseball players or basketball players in, in high school or college, and they didn't make it past the first couple weeks. So it, it is really about your heart. Uh, and, and that's the key to making it through training. What does uh, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud mean? Well, this really is about hope and, and the ability of one person to bring you hope. So on Wednesday of Hell Week, so Hell Week occurs in the first week or in the first phase of training. And for us, it was about six weeks into the basic uh, first phase. And it is essentially six days of no sleep and constant harassment. But on Wednesday of Hell Week, they send you down to the mud flats, or they used to when I went through training. Uh, they've had to move it uh, since then. But the mud flats were a, a slew of, of mud, and the mud was anywhere from three to four feet deep. But when you sat down in it, you were essentially you know, covered in mud. Um, and, and it was the hardest day of Hell Week. And everybody knew that if you could make it through the mud flats, chances are you were going to make it through the rest of the week. And, and at one point in time, we had the entire class uh, was in the mud flats, and we'd been in there for a long time, and it was cold. It was nighttime. Wind coming off the ocean was, was cold. And, and the instructor said, look, uh, I'll let all you guys out. You can have a cup of hot chocolate. we got some coffee over here. Sit by the fire. But all I need is for five guys to quit. If just five guys will quit, then the whole class can come out. And, boy, I was, you know, even in the dark of the night, you could see some guys were going to quit. And then all of a sudden, one guy started singing. And I can't repeat the song because it wouldn't be appropriate in, in any sort of mixed <laughs> company. But suffice to say that all of a sudden, that brought us together. And because one guy, one guy had the courage, and, of course, the instructors kept yelling at him to stop singing, but he kept singing. And before long, one guy started singing, then two, then three, then we were all singing. And, of course, the instructor said, well, then you're going to stay in here the rest of the night. 
but the fact of the matter was uh, that gave us hope. And, and the, the point was sometimes that's what you need. You know, when you're up to your neck in mud, just one guy that starts singing. And then when you look across the world and you look at, you know, the, the young girl from Pakistan, Malala, and how she brought hope to millions. You know, you look at, at Martin Luther King and Mandela and others and the hope that they brought to uh, the people of the world. Sometimes all it takes is one person. And, uh, and that's the analogy behind singing when you're up to your neck in mud. And you're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. We've got our final national segment coming up with Admiral McRaven. Never, ever ring the bell. And we're talking to retired Navy Admiral Bill McRaven. On this uh, never, ever ring the bell, you can tell folks uh, what, that, uh, what that means first. Well, in SEAL training, we have a brass bell. And, uh, and if you want to quit training, all you have to do is ring the bell three times and you're out. There's no questions asked. And, and that bell is kind of ever-present. It's there when you do your morning PT. It's always in the back of your mind. And so the point is, if you want to make it through training, it's easy. You don't have to be the fastest, the strongest. You just have, you have to make sure you don't quit. And quitting was ringing the bell. It was a very visible, uh, audible sound that somebody was quitting. And you'd hear throughout the day, somebody would quit, ring the bell, drop their helmet, and they were out. The story is really about life. And, and again, you're going to have a lot of opportunities in life uh, that will knock you down pretty hard. And, and the analogy is just don't ring the bell. Uh, just don't quit when those tough times come. You'll make it through. You'll have friends that will help you, but you'll make it through those tough times, and, and you'll be able to come out the other, other side a better man or woman. Let me ask you, people tell me sometimes I'm stupid because I don't know when to quit. Um, where is that fine line? And in the military, you could say, we, you know, we hung around Vietnam maybe too long. Where is the line between never ringing the bell and, hey, you know, you got to move on? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. The point about never ringing the bell is more of a personal point than it is about a strategic, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq. Mm-hmm. It's really about, you know, the, the, the personal challenges you're going to have in life. And, and I think, you know, most people can intellectually know, OK, it, it's time to stop pursuing something. Um, but quitting really is about when the when the challenges get tough and you're, you know, you, you mentally all, all of a sudden you're exhausted uh, physically, you're exhausted, but it's something you really, truly wanted. Um, and, and that's the time not to quit. Or, you know, when, you know, as uh, I mentioned in the book, but frankly, I saw it hundreds of times, these young kids in Iraq and Afghanistan, that were very, very badly injured, you know, single, double, triple, quadruple amputees, hmm. uh, kids that were blinded. And time and time again, uh, they, they refused to quit. They refused to quit on life. Uh, they refused to quit on their hopes of being productive. Most of these young men and women were young. They knew they had a long life ahead of them. And so, you know, you're, you don't want to ever quit in that case. Uh, and, and so this idea of don't ring the bell, I can tell you I've had a number of them that have written me and said uh, because they worked for me in some capacity in Iraq or Afghanistan and they were wounded in the process, they would say, I'm never going to ring the bell. That's what it's about. Uh, it's not necessarily about looking strategically at an Afghanistan or Iraq or a, or, or a Vietnam. I think that, that's an intellectual discussion. This is more of a, of a personal discussion. I always admire these guys who lose limbs or whatever. They don't seem to give up on their dreams, and they're more interested almost in getting back with their brethren abroad. Never once did I meet a kid that didn't say, I just want to get back to my unit. Uh, always remarkable and uh, really a reflection on the great young men and women that are in the military today as well. Do you have any concern? I know there's been some recent uh, challenges that the SEALs are facing challenges, a bit of a drug problem or whatever. Now, these guys are kind of wild ducks to begin with, right? That's part of the reason you guys put them there. Are you worried about that culture or that threat of drug problem? Well, I think you you always have to worry uh, when guys are in combat as long as we've been in combat. You you think back to to 9-11, and so many of these uh, young men who are no longer young men, you know, they signed up after 9-11 or maybe they were in the teams before 9-11. And for the last, uh, you know, 15, almost 16 years, they have been fighting constantly. Uh, this is an incredible amount of pressure on not only on the SEALs, not only on the, the SEALs, but the soldiers, sailors, uh, airmen and Marines that are also out there and their families. 
So you always, always have to be looking for indicators of, uh, of you know, drug abuse, uh, spousal abuse, bad, bad things that are happening uh, because they're generally happening for a reason. Uh, and a lot of times that is just the stress of combat manifesting itself back at home. In fact, in the special ops folks have borne, you know, maybe a bigger, biggest percentage of the uh, of the duties there, the military duties. Let me ask you this, this question about military leadership in the civilian political world. We've got General Mattis at the Defense Department, General McMaster at the National Security, General Kelly at the uh, Department of Homeland Securities. Do you think that it, it, it's a it's a transition that that uh, that can be successful, uh, or in, and should generals uh, be able to go into the political world? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I know all three of those. Uh, right. Those generals very, very well, and they are remarkable, remarkable men, mm-hmm. and uh, and they are going to serve this administration very well. I, it's like anything else. I think it depends on the individual you choose. Uh, you know, I don't know that you can just label them as a general and expect that they will either succeed or fail. Mm-hmm. I think you have to look at the individual. And in the case of, uh, of a Jim Mattis, uh, who was, uh, you know, just an exceptional uh, Marine officer, and John Kelly, an exceptional Marine officer, and HR, an exceptional Army officer, uh, they all have great character, great credibility. They will sp- speak truth to power, uh, which, uh, frankly, again, each one of those gentlemen, uh, that was uh, part of their reputation in the military in a very good way. Uh, so these are the qualities that you're looking for, not just in a general, but in anybody that's going to serve the president of the United States. So I don't know that it's so much about being a general or an admiral. I think it's more about the quality of the person that they're picking. And in this case, they're three uh, excellent men. And I've, I've only know of General Mattis uh, well, and I have never heard a guy who I have never heard a single negative comment about in any way. I mean, he must be just an amazing human being. And on John Kelly, from your book, Be Your Best in Darkest Moments, it's really inspirational. He lost his own son in, uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq, right? He did. And, it's, uh, and you know, I wrote this story before uh, the, uh, the election and certainly before John Kelly went on to be uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. So, um, but, but this is, again, about the, the quality of the man, uh, not, not just that he lost his son, uh, in combat, uh, but that uh, that he is he went on to uh, to overcome that. Uh, he was absolutely his best in his darkest moment, but that really inspired people around him, myself included, and I know everybody that John Kelly came in contact with, who understood the backstory uh, to watch John and and how poised he was, um, you know how how strong he was in the face of incredible adversity, uh, how he and his wife overcame this terrible tragedy and yet went on to continue to do great things in the military, really gave us all hope. Uh, just a couple seconds. How are you finding the academic world after the military world? <laughs> I love it, actually. Do you? you know, I, it's, oh, I absolutely do. Uh, you know, one day you're talking to a Nobel laureate. The next day you're talking to a Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, the, the great diversity of what goes on at the University of Texas system is, uh, is remarkable. And you're going to get uh, the football, pro- football program turned and, around, right? And I am absolutely certain we're going to have a great football year. You bet. (laughs) We've had a great fast hour, 10 little things that can have a big impact. It is a life-changing book, and I hope at minimum everybody starts making their bed well. And uh, I want to thank Admiral McRaven for his service. Obviously, an honor to have him here. Make your bed little things that can change your life and maybe the world. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks to Admiral McRaven. Thanks to our national audience for listening. We'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.